the Supreme Allied Commander visited us at one time, and he basically said, what you guys are there for is to buy me time, uh, to give the Allies in Western Europe the time to set up to meet and, and engage the enemy. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Good evening. The stunning overthrow of Mikhail Gorbachev by communist hardliners dominates the news this Monday. The Chinese army, the Chinese police are advancing through the city from a variety of directions on Tiananmen Square. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. James Stayscale served for 23 years with US Special Forces, including two tours in Berlin. Special Forces Berlin was a small detachment of 100 highly trained soldiers who, should hostilities break out, were to wreak havoc behind Warsaw Pact lines. The US government only acknowledged its existence in 2014 and James has written an incredible story of how these unsung heroes would have fought and died on what was effectively a one-way mission. Now, if you can spare it, I'm asking listeners to contribute at least three US dollars per month to help keep us on the air. Plus, you get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a monthly financial supporter of the podcast. You bask in the warm glow of knowing you are helping preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Thanks to our latest Patreons, including Ian Krangle, Steve Minigar, Ryan King, Claudia Morgenstern, Mike Sir, Graham Randall... Ian Mackay Dal, Mike Chapman, Michael O'Donnell, Robert Crom, and Jeffrey Jones. Don't forget, in this episode, we have a book giveaway of James's book, Special Forces Berlin. So make sure you listen through right to the end for details of how to enter. Back to today's episode. The story starts with James's initial recruitment into the US Army. We welcome James to our Cold War conversation. I think the best way to put it is that my father recruited me into the Army. (laughs) My my father uh, served in World War II in Europe, and um, I was always fascinated with the Army, you know, as a child, playing Army with the neighborhood kids. And um, he... um, He was active duty only during the war and during the Korean War, Uh, but Every summer he would come home from summer camp and bring uh, bring something back with him, and you know whether it was uh, sea rations or patches from units he worked with, uh, a, a training manual, something like that. He always dumped them on my bed. And one year he brought home a recruiting brochure for special forces. I believe this was like 1964, 65, and it was one of these glossy brochures. I don't believe the Special Air Service has them over there, but uh, we, of course, did. But uh, it was a glossy brochure with pictures showing uh, Special Forces soldiers in all kinds of environments with all the strange equipment they used, jumping out of airplanes, uh, using Russian weapons. And that got me really intrigued. Um, I was already very intrigued in things like uh, Ian Fleming, um, I had read a lot of the books about the Office of Strategic Services, the Long Range Desert Groups, um, SOE, and things like that in World War II. So I was interested not so much in espionage per se, but but unconventional warfare as it applied to the military. What uh, what uh, Churchill would call his uh, sort of um, dirty tricks, boys, and that 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 was what it was. I went to college. Uh, university um, could not decided could not decide what I wanted to do, and then said, "Well, it's about time that I join the army," <laughs> and so I enlisted. So, 
Right, right. And presumably you it, what you couldn't enlist straight into special forces. You were in like a regular unit to start with. That's correct. Um, I came in um, under the infantry rubric. Uh, I went to the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, served with them for a while, and then managed fairly quickly to escape that place, uh, which was... Um, <laughs> Which was a good thing. Right after Vietnam was not the best place to be in the regular army, quite frankly. Uh, a lot of discipline problems, a lot of drug problems. And I said, um, I'd rather go over here. And I managed to pass the basic entry um, requirements and then tried out for the assessment and selection. So that was 1973. Right. Yeah. Right. And I I also read that you you came across detachment A on a on an exercise as well. Uh that is true. We um I was assigned to my first special forces unit was in uh, the northeastern United States. Uh, it was 10th Special Forces Group which uh, specialized on the European operational area. And we used to do a couple of annual exercises um, in Europe, and uh, my detachment, my team, um, parachuted into southern Germany, and we were basically working against a, a quote-unquote aggressor enemy force, which was um, one I can't remember exactly one which one, but one of the one of the conventional infantry units in in southern Germany. But um, one of the uh, so-called underground people that was helping us was we would often see him. He was wearing civilian clothes. He spoke very good German, and I thought he was a German until I asked my team sergeant about him, and I came to learn that there was another small detachment of special forces people stationed in Berlin, and this guy was one of them. And from that moment on, I made it my mission <laughs> to get to that unit, uh, and I did about uh, four years later. Right. And and what were the qualifications to be able to join that unit? Did they come and find you or did you make it clear that's where you wanted to go? I made it very clear to the people in the recruitment branch at um, in Washington that that's where I wanted to go. Uh, at that particular juncture, if you were in special forces, you were qualified to go to any of the special forces units, um, save perhaps the language qualification. So if you spoke Spanish, you would go to seventh group uh, uh, in Panama or something like that. Um, tenth group had a lot of uh, European targets. People spoke all the different languages. I, from the, the outset, uh, strove to learn German, and that was the required language to get to Berlin. Um, obviously, you had to have a, a pretty good record you couldn't have any strikes against you but um, they uh, were looking for german language special forces qualified people it was a small unit only about 90 people and of those uh, there were six 11 man teams so doing the mathematics uh, it was 66 people on the team so it was a small unit yeah yeah and wh what were the sort of people like in in the unit itself Oh, it was. I'm not sure what the uh, what the comparison would be, but it, it was a very interesting place to be. We've had a number of people that were born and bred Americans, um, but we also had a high percentage. About that time, it was about 25 uh, percent. Before I got there, it was even higher of uh, Eastern European. Uh, what we called logic people, people who had come to the United States and gotten their citizenship by serving in the military. Uh, we had quite a few of those. And we had a number of Germans, too, uh, Germans who had come to the United States and decided to be a soldier and ended up going back. So we had, uh, for example, we had a Polish um, 
merchant marine man who had jumped ship and joined the army. We had a commander who was a uh, uh, Czech uh, resistance fighter during World War II. He had actually escaped Czechoslovakia and then gone to France and fought with the French resistance. Uh, the senior enlisted man was a German uh, who, at the end of the war, he was about 14, I believe, uh, was a member of the German uh, resistance organization called the Werewolves. Um, but luckily, he saw the handwriting on the wall rather quickly and surrendered to the Americans. And once he found out what the Americans were like, he decided he wanted to go to the United States. So it was quite, uh, it was quite a place. It was quite interesting. Wow, it sounds more like the French Foreign Legion. Than- <laughs> uh, there, that's actually what the Lodge Act was referred to when it first started up in the 1950s. And, and the detachment, I think in 1960, it started in 1956, but Special Forces and uh, the people in Bed Holtz, which was the other Special Forces unit in, in Europe uh, and Berlin, were there were a, quite a few uh, Eastern European uh, emigres, uh, and many of them uh, made a lot of the interesting history in the unit. One guy was, uh, he didn't serve in Berlin, but he was a, a, a Finnish um, soldier during World War II, a guy by the name of Larry Torne, and actually won Finland's highest honor uh, and ended up uh, emigrating to the United States. And uh, he was serving in Vietnam on a classified mission when uh, he and his team actually disappeared. So a lot of interesting people. Yeah, yeah, no, ab- absolutely, absolutely. And can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what the training consisted of for Detachment A? Well, you would already gone through your, your special forces training, I guess. What, 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 correct. What uh, other specialist training? Well, the the mission for the unit was not unlike the missions for the other special forces units. Um, although in in Vietnam there was a switch to more counter guerrilla fighting, the mission for special forces in Europe was basically unconventional warfare behind the lines. Um, as we were in Berlin, already behind essentially the lines, uh, our We didn't have to worry so much about getting into where we were going to fight the war. That's where we were already. So we concentrated on being able to go underground and survive. Um, And that meant we had to be able to not only have good field training, um, how to to work in the woods, but how to survive in an urban environment. Uh, So we relied on the experts from the CIA. A lot of uh, CIA officers came to Berlin to help us out, to instruct. Most of them were former Office of Strategic Service uh, officers, and they would teach things like um, uh, sabotage, um, intelligence tradecraft techniques, how to communicate uh, in a secure manner in a city, um, things like uh, recruitment of uh, assets, uh, we also worked on technical things like uh, breaking and entering, um, how to pick locks, uh, how to get into a building, uh, how to ca- how to um, counterfeit documents. Uh, it was a lot easier than um, some things that are fairly difficult today. We could we could do easily back then, but uh, it was a very diverse kind of um, training schedule. We did all the hard skills, shooting, uh, explosives, but uh, had to also concentrate on things like being able to identify uh, Soviet units, Soviet equipment, uh, East German equipments, so that we could report back and tell the tell the command structure exactly what we were seeing in our operational area. So, right. Right. And so did you have like your own legends, your own fake ID and safe houses and, and stuff like that? We we acquired safe houses. Uh, we had IDs. The agency helped us out with that. Uh, each person uh, developed uh, an 
a cover story for what would fit his personality and his abilities and skills. Um, we had people that were quite naturally, um, you know, they spoke fluently Polish or Turkish. That would be their become their identity. Uh, we had other people like me who would speak uh, Greek. Although I spoke German well, my German was not high enough. Uh, I, I couldn't fool an East German security officer, let's put it <laughs> that way. But you know, my Greek was at a level that I could speak Greek and pull that one off. So I had Greek documentation that was produced back in the United States. So, uh, we did not use those on a daily basis. Uh, that was stuff that would come out during the wartime Uh but um, we we had that for our wartime mission. Uh, right. When we were doing things, when we were doing things during the peacetime mode, uh, we would often use other identifications, and it would be either German or uh, American uh, identification. We were not always soldiers. Let's put it that way. Right. Right, and I was I was going to cu- come on to that, but can you just tell me a little bit about you know what what your your targets would have been? Because as I understand it, there were two units to remain in Berlin, and then the other four were supposed to cross the wall and uh, attempt various missions in East Germany. Um. This is where it started to get into the question of suicidal mission or not. Uh, (laughs) The the units that were to stay inside Berlin uh, had targets that would be kind of fixed targets like um, power plants and things like that that uh, had to be knocked out to ensure the Soviets or the East Germans could not use them if they managed to get into the city. For the teams that went out uh, outside the, the wall, the targets were, in some cases, more difficult and in some cases easier. But the main thing we were looking at was how do we slow down the Russian forces or the, the Soviet um, forces from moving west towards the Volta Gap? And that basically keyed in on the the railway around Berlin. Uh, All the rail traffic from the Warsaw Pact, from from East Germany, from Poland, and from the Soviet Union, the majority of it, not I said all, but the majority of it went uh, around Berlin, uh, what was called the Berliner Ring. So that was one of our primary targets. There were also uh, some hard targets, uh, the Russian uh, uh, command post, uh, which was south of Berlin, the East German command post, which was north of Berlin. Those all became uh, targets for us at one time. How were you expected to take on a target like that? Because presumably it would have been guarded by thousands of Soviet troops, for example. Well, we we had the um, notion that most of these areas would not be heavily as heavily defended during wartime as they would be during peacetime. Uh, if the Russians were in an offensive mode, most of their special units and heavy units would be moving forward. So a very small team. Uh, would be able to infiltrate uh, into an area and do as much damage as possible. Um, I won't go into the specific methodologies, but there were some methodologies that would not require um, getting too close to the facility. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're going to leave it very enigmatic like that. (laughs) Unfortunately, yes. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's fine. (laughs) That's fine. That's fine. No, that that's that that's really interesting. There. The other thing that I read is that I know you're probably going to hate me asking this question, but and you you may not answer it anyway. But I've read that you know you did have some quite advanced gadgets uh, in the team, almost James Bond like. Well, we had um, we had a lot of 
interesting individual equipment. And I think if you pick up an SOE training manual, a lot of the stuff that would show up in those manuals were similar to things that we had. Um, suppressed weapons, uh, silenced weapons, uh, specialty kind of explosives, uh, Miniature radios, not miniature, but compact radios. Uh, a lot of a lot of stuff that the regular special forces units did not have. Uh, we also got um, we all the weapons that we carried were were uh, not American. Uh, they were either sterile weapons or they were Soviet block weapons. Um, so we had a we had the full gamut of of interesting things to use. Um, and then we had access uh, to other other things that that would become available if necessary. Yeah, no, I I was surprised to see that you know that there was a photo I think in the book of somebody using a well rod, which was a British manufactured uh, noise suppressed weapon from World War Two, which seemed appeared to be very vintage. <laughs> It, it was very vintage, and I, I've written a couple of articles about that weapon since then. But that weapon um, was originally built by Station 6 of the SOE, um, a thirty two caliber weapon. And then they shipped one to the United States, and we decided we liked it. We also made them. Uh, we made a 9 millimeter version. I think the British did also. But that weapon was continued to be produced for quite a while, and... Uh, I if I am my information is correct the the SAS had them in their inventory uh up until just after the Falklands war or possibly the first desert storm um and my unit had uh the unit in Berlin had them uh, until at least 1990 um so they they were still um they were a favored weapon. It was the well rod was a true suppressed weapon, um, silenced weapon, yeah. I should say. Uh, with a lot of suppressed weapons, you will hear the actual pop of a round going off. With with the well rod, you could actually hear the hammer hitting the firing pin. You wouldn't hear the 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 round going off, and it was it was not the, fa- the fastest weapon to reload. I had, it was more like a plumbing implement. <laughs> You had to you had to twist a knob on the rear end and then cycle it, and so to fire two rounds required about three seconds. Right. Um, so you had to count on uh, your first round doing what what it needed to do. Yeah, so. but but you're right. I mean, you know, I've you know, I'm familiar with some of the special operations executive. Um, weapons that were used during World War Two, and the, the example that sort of sprung he in in the book was the um was the explosives within lumps of coal yeah those those were we had those um interestingly enough those would work for things like uh i mean by the 1970s they would work for a thing like a coal-fired plant uh power plant they would not work on a coal locomotive because these germans by that time were crushing all their coal and feeding it in as a powder a more efficient method and that ruined the effect there so some of the things that we had became obsolete over time um and the coal the coal was one of them basically right right and for the for the teams that were planning their um attacks across the Berlin Wall, how were they making themselves familiar with their targets? Berlin probably had the highest concentration of intelligence units anywhere in the world at that time, uh, both both Warsaw Pact and Allied. And one of the great things about being there is if you wanted to know <laughs> who lived at a specific location in East Germany, you could pick up a phone book, which had been smuggled across the wall and, and check out and see who was there. We, we had exquisite maps uh, from the Russians, from the East Germans, plus our own maps, uh, British, uh, British survey maps. Uh, photography was great. Um, and then we had uh, the military liaison mission, which were the um, was the Allied missions that 
actually drove in East Germany. Uh, the British had a version called Bricks Mix, uh, the British mission. Uh, the French had one, but we, we had a, our mission, and we would do exchanges. Um, we would send a non-commissioned officer over, and they would act as one of the uh, observers or drivers with these cars, and we would be able to go out with these guys, and they would do their mission, and we would tag along and see what we needed to see. Uh, we could get uh, ground ground photography uh, out of the car, and uh, you know, it was it was the perfect uh, the perfect method to to uh, do our early reconnaissance of a target. Yeah, yeah. And so, and if you were in one of these teams that was going across the wall, did you you knew what targets you were supposed to attack? We did. Yeah. Right. And and so, what can you tell me? What targets you you were, were you in one of the teams that had to cross? Um, I, w- I was there on I was there on two two different um, tours, and both times I had on each one I had a different target. Um, on the first one, it was a series of bridges um, and railway inter- interchanges that uh, we were targeted to, to damage or destroy. And the second time around was a control facility at uh, one of the strategic, one of the Russian airfields. Um, completely different kind of way to approach the targets, but uh, we had to get all the information uh, to from from basically the, the the beginning how to get out of the city, get to the target, how to approach the target and actually eliminate it and then hopefully be able to get out of the area. Uh, quite frankly, our uh, chances of survival were probably not very good. Um, that's a that's an <laughs> understatement, James. <laughs> yeah. and, and our longevity wasn't real, real long either. Uh, but, but, um, the Supreme Allied Commander visited us at one time. It was General Rogers. And he basically said, what you guys are there for is to buy me time, uh, to give the, the Allies in West Western Europe the time to set up to meet and, and engage the enemy. And so our, our uh, mission was to delay the Russians. Um, Later on in the 80s, uh, we were issued things like um, uh, anti-materiel rifles, which I think are better known now as the the 50 caliber sniper rifle. Uh, The idea was to engage uh, the Soviet uh, strategic rocket forces behind the lines, uh, the Scud missiles. Like the SS-20. SS-20s, the Scuds, everything. Uh, A single round in a Russian rocket would would destroy it. Um, if you penetrated the skin of the rocket, it was no good. Um, and when you can shoot a target from two miles away, it's, um, it's hard to defend against. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in, in terms of, I mean, what, you know, I talked about you crossing the Berlin wall, which probably makes it sound far easier than it, it, it would have been at the time, but how, how were you going to get over or, or under the wall. How did you plan that? Well, each um, basically each team was responsible for coming up with its own plan. I can't speak to those teams' plans because we didn't talk about them to each other. Everything was compartmented. Um, but we had to come up with plans and then brief the commanders. And if the commander was satisfied, he let you continue with that plan. And then we would relook them every uh, every so often. You had to do a reconnaissance of not only the wall, you had to know exactly what was on the other side of the wall. And that's where we were uh, relying on those reconnaissance assets, the overhead pictures. The last thing you wanted to do was cross the wall and get happy and then find out that you were actually in an East German Army training area, uh, (laughs) which which was very possible if you weren't watching, <laughs> watching yeah. what was going on. So we, we had to do a lot of reconnaissance. Getting across the wall was not that difficult. Uh, the hard part 
was staying, getting away from it, and then becoming more or less invisible uh, for the next part of the mission, which was moving from Berlin to wherever your target was. Right, and that would have been on foot, I presume? Uh, For the most part, yeah. Uh, And we would not move in large teams. We would break down into smaller groups of teams. Uh, Some would be in um, East German uh, uniform. Others would move as civilian clothes. Uh, You're talking about moving men, equipment, radios, um, all the the equipment necessary. So uh, it's, yeah. Anyway, so you so you did have East German army uniforms, uh, yeah, right, okay, yeah. and I mean we we talked about it earlier that you know that the, the chances of surviving or or getting back were were not good. How did you feel about this basically being a suicide mission? Well, I I, th- I think I've written a couple of times that that we didn't really think about it that much. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether we were being overly optimistic or we actually thought that um, we we could make this happen. I think it was a combination of all the above. Um, we were hoping we wouldn't have to go to war, obviously, but if, if it did come, we were prepared to uh, take the chances, accept the odds, and try to do what we needed to do. Um, we did not have a real sense that the um, the enemy, the East Germans or the Russians, uh, knew what we were going to do and where we were going to do it. So we felt that if we could clear the wall and get away from it, that our chances of success went up uh, astronomically. Right, right. Because I mean, e- even if you're you're not um, killed, if if you were captured and you're in East German uniform, then uh, the either the East Germans or the Soviets wouldn't take too kindly to that, would they? No, um, and that was that was an accepted fact. That was that goes back to basically the start of special forces. Um, one one of the first uh, commanders made it part of his um, of the agreement you would sign that would basically you understand that you may be out of uniform and this means you'll be in violation of the uh, uh, Geneva and the Hague conventions and could easily be shot that way and that was that was something that everyone accepted so. So the moral of the story was don't get captured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a big incentive. Big incentive yeah. there. Yeah. Um what you, you know you mentioned earlier about the about the Soviets and the, and the East Germans. Were were they aware that there were special forces in Berlin? Um we always conjectured that they did know um In my subsequent research, uh, when I wrote the book, uh, the first time we show up in the East German security service files is about 1975. Um, So that means the unit had been in existence for about 20 years before they figured out someone was there. Uh, The Russians uh, claim that they knew, uh, but they put the strength of the unit at about 800. Um, so that was about 10 times our actual size. Um, our main worry was that, again, that they would get to us before we were able to go into action. So even if they knew where we were located, if in time of war we got away from that area quickly over the wall, then the chances of the Russians or the East Germans catching us uh were dramatically decreased. Right. Um, I, d- I also read that, that you were also trained to sort of set up escape and evasion networks for downed pilots. Is that correct? There was... 
that was one of the implied missions that we were given. Uh, that would have been probably a long-term mission, obviously. Uh, and it would have been also fairly difficult to do. Um, I have to say that a lot of the theories of working behind the lines were taking, taken from our experiences in places like France and Yugoslavia, uh, and the British had the same experience. Uh, what was, however, somewhat ignored or downplayed played was the experiences that we had in the Ukraine and Albania, which were abject failures. So if you sort of interpolate between the two, what an E and E network requires or an underground network requires is a populace that will support you. Uh, it's much more difficult in a total security state like East Germany. Um, so we didn't expect a whole lot of help at the outset. Uh, if the war had gone long, a long period, if we had survived for those period, then obviously you would have had a better chance of setting up some sort of an underground network, either for sabotage or for escape and invasion. But right off the bat, that would have been extremely difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, some of the exercises that you were involved in, I was fascinated in your book about Red Sail. That's began in the mid-1970s, and that was when we were beginning to get more and more involved in uh, counterterrorism. And also, it was one of the key skills that, that put us into Iran during the Iran hostage crisis. But essentially, the British uh, uh, security institutes... Um, invited the Americans to send over some people to test their security. Um, and it turned out that it was MI5 and MI6 primarily that were interested in this. But um, our unit was tasked because we had the, the mission of operating in civilian clothes in urban areas. And we began to send over small teams to run exercises in the southwest of England and uh, test your security apparatus. Um, and it was basically, we went over to basically mimic what an IRA terror cell would do in the UK. And uh, the British uh, Organizers would give us specific objectives, and then we would try to carry them out. Um, it, it ran the gamut from uh, sabotage of a power plant uh, to going in and doing a um, exfiltration of a prisoner outside of a, from a uh, British uh, police uh, headquarters, things like that. Uh, so it was really a really a fascinating exercise exercise for us. And that was back in the days when you could actually bake a file into a loaf of bread and bring it through customs. So was, I thought that was only in comics, James. No, we, we actually did that. <laughs> we wow. actually brought in we actually brought in radios. We didn't carry weapons, but we brought in radios and other things that way. Wow. Wow. Obviously we've talked very extensively there about the wartime role that you had, but in peacetime I understand you were working quite closely with military units like the SAS and the German GSG-9 as well. Uh, that, is, that is true. We uh, also had a good relationship with the uh, German SEK in Berlin uh, because uh, Berlin was not part of federal Germany, so uh, it was occupied Germany, essentially. Uh, German federal troops could not go into that area, so we the German police had their special unit, which was essentially a corollary to the GSG-9 people. But um, we we have always operated with uh, Allied forces, Allied Special Operations Forces, and naturally the SAS was one of them. Um, the uh, Germans were, were another one. And both through the Red Sails operations and through um, the heightened um, 
terrorist environment in the early 1970s, we began to work even closer with some of these units so that we could develop uh, a counterterrorism capability of our own. And Berlin was actually the first um, army unit that was tasked uh, with counterterrorism as one of its missions. And uh, the Red Sails... Um, Exercise was was a very good um, demonstrator of how it's necessary to think and act like a terrorist if you're going to be able to counter them, and so that those those kind of exercises were perfect for for the unit. And um, we build up our our clandestine skills, and then we build up our our tactical hard skills. Uh, a lot of our shooting techniques came from the SAS, the close quarter battle techniques. Um, uh, we also worked with the Germans on uh, taking down airplanes, um, although the the Germans uh, were working with the SAS for their Mogadishu operation. Uh, we did cross training with the GSG-9 quite often. Obviously, you wouldn't have been able to do all this training in Berlin, but did you do some training in Doughboy City? We we did do training in Doughboy City. Um, we did training out in West Germany. Obviously, the heavier skills like uh, explosives and things, if we were going to do some big stuff, we had to go outside the city. Um, we did... Um, we did exercises in Western Germany, but uh, we did have one really interesting um, opportunity in Berlin. Uh, the Lufthansa was not allowed to fly into Berlin at the time, so it was uh, British Airways, Air France, and Pan Am at the time. Well, the Pan Am uh, station manager in Berlin has realized that aircraft hijacking was was an issue uh i came to the commander of berlin and said listen um you know this is sort of a area of concern for us and i imagine it is for you i said if you have some people that would like to come out and play on our airplanes i would be happy to facilitate that so he set it up that we could go out to tegel uh airport and actually do practice runs on their airplanes at night um, off in one of the corners of the airfield. And then slowly, we also got people into Pan Am uniform, and we were working on the active runways <laughs> as Pan Am employees. So if you had flown into Tegel Airfield on a Pan Am airline, one of the ground crew guys that you saw unloading your bags might have been one of our people. Wow. Wow. And I, I guess that gave you familiarization with that sort of role so that you could disguise yourself as baggage handler, you know, if, if you know, there was a hijack situation, I suppose. Very much so. Um, we got to the point where the – Pan Am ground crew people were teaching us how to uh, basically taxi the airplanes. And obviously this was only for emergency purposes, but they gave us enough instruction on how to get into the airplane, how to turn on all the power, uh, how to get access to everything underneath the airplane. Uh, we also found out, for example, ways to get into the cockpit through the uh, baggage compartments on certain airplanes. Um, we practice uh, full-on assaults on airplanes, uh, opening doors, opening the windows over the wings, although the passengers on that flight the next day might have been somewhat uncomfortable had they known that little guys were punching through their windows the night before. Um so it, it was quite a unique experience and quite valuable as far as as far as the mission went. Uh, all our teams rotated through that uh, that type of training uh, on an on an annual basis. Yeah, wow, incredible stories. And I think it, now's a probably a good time for us to come on to your book because what what you're doing here is not purely documenting the period that you were in um detachment a um but the history of u.s special forces from 1956 to 1990 that uh that's correct um uh, 
the unit uh, gets together once a year, um, and uh, as long as we're all still around, which is not going to be much longer. But uh, at one of these little events, someone said, uh, we ought to document our history uh, because the Army isn't going to do it, and we're sort of disappearing off the face of the earth. And it was agreed to, and then someone mentioned the fact that I had written a book and said, Ah, oh, he can do it. <laughs> and so I was sort of volunteered into it. But it became um, sort of a three-year odyssey for me. Um, I interviewed quite a few of the original guys, the guys that came up in 1956, those that were around, uh, some of the people that uh, facilitated the startup of the unit and went all the way through from 1956 to 1990. Um talking to people, uh, getting files together, um, finding out as much as uh, I could, much information that was still there um, to write the story. The only real difficult part I had doing it, a few of the people said they didn't want to be interviewed because of their security requirements. And I agreed with them. I told them I was going to go through the proper security pr procedures, and then they promptly hung up on me. Um, <laughs> but that was, that was a minor issue. One of one of the guys actually called back six months later and said, "I hear you're writing a book." I <laughs> wanted to be interviewed. But, uh, the most difficult part was uh, getting it through the uh, uh, declassification process because up to that point. Nothing had been written on the unit. Nothing had been declassified. And I was told by several people that I could not write the book. Um, and yeah. I said, I, I understand how the system works, but uh, one of the folks I talked to was a three-star general. He was the command of Army Special Operations at the time. And he said, um, I think it's a good idea. I wish you luck. And um, that was basically all the... the encouragement I needed. Uh, so I wrote the book and called up the Pentagon and said, hey, I've got this thing I would like you to look at. And they said, okay. 14 months later, <laughs> it, it was uh, approved for release. So that was the declassification process. What, what I'd like to do is just pick out a few pieces from, from the book because I, I, I sure. did find it interesting. And while some people might be interested in the latter part of the Cold War, covering it from 1956 does provide really useful context as to how these units were formed. But in there, you've got some great anecdotes. I think my favorite one, there was a unit doing uh, some surveillance training and they tagged a guy coming through Checkpoint Charlie. And they ended up in a cafe later. Can you just describe that one? Well, that... Um as I mentioned before, Berlin was a focal point. I think Vienna and, and Berlin were two of the big focal points in Europe for espionage. But uh, there were always something strange going on in the city. And uh, this gentleman was in the unit in the early 60s and was doing some training with um, some of our friends from the States. And they decided they were going to watch the uh, checkpoints where people crossed over from east to west and they picked up a gentleman and began to follow him um, a team full of I think five or six people he said and they spent most of the morning following this gentleman around and at some point in the game they realized that he was playing a game with them and um, he would disappear and then he would reappear in front of them and they would follow him along. And finally he went into a restaurant and they decided, well, we've got to go see what he's doing. So they sent a couple of people into the restaurant and they sat in different tables. And before long, the gentleman they had been following got up and came over to one of the, one of the members of the surveillance team and said, um, Hey, um, I'd really like to talk to you guys. Uh, would you come sit with me? And it turned out he never admitted which side he was with or who he was working for, but he proceeded to critique the the people that were in the restaurant for a couple of minutes, and then they went outside and, and they practiced surveillance techniques with him being the instructor. So 
they went off at the end of the day, not knowing if they had been following a German, an East German, or a CIA agent, or something else. But uh, it was one of one of those just totally unique experiences. I'd love to believe that the guy was from the Stasi. <laughs> <laughs> I, at that time, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I had a couple of incidents um, myself. Uh, we were doing some a pra- doing a practice run downtown once, and I was watching a meeting between one of the guys in the units and another target. Let's put it that way. He was in a restaurant or an outside restaurant, and the restaurant was inside of an atrium and there were several restaurants around and I was off to the side trying to take pictures of our guy talking to one guy when I noticed another guy that was sitting in the middle of the atrium that had a briefcase next to him and he kept very discreetly turning his briefcase sort of on an arc to cover a different restaurant and I'm going well that's kind of odd and then he turned it a little bit further and I could see from where I was with my telephoto lens and my camera, I could see an aperture on his briefcase. This wasn't a guy that was from one of our, anybody I knew It wasn't out of our unit. It was another guy surveilling a different meeting at a different restaurant. <laughs> oh, I, I took pictures of him and then turned him over to our local representatives. Um, and they said, thank you very much, and shut the door in my face. And I never heard another thing about it. But I, I like to think that this guy was probably, he might have been a West German security guy. He might have been an East German Stasi officer. I never found out. But those kind of things happen all the time. Well, the, the Berlin does have this moniker of uh, City of Spies, and uh, that definitely, that story yeah. definitely yeah. illustrated that well. Um one of the other stories that I hadn't heard of um, was the trash can nukes. Can you just share a little bit about that? Uh, we're going into sensitive territory, so I'll, I'll tell you what I can. Uh, in the late 1950s, uh, the American Army uh, decided that they needed a very powerful weapon uh, to use on the ground as a way to deny um, an advancing force access to things like bridges. And basically what it was was an adapted uh, nuclear weapon. Um, the, the original one was an adaptation of a uh, nuclear bomb, a small one, and it came in three different pieces would be assembled in the field. And the idea was that they would give it to combat engineer units who were trying to slow down the Russians. And they would be able to take this device, assemble it, and quickly put it under a bridge and destroy the bridge. Um, That was a great way to knock something down quickly. It didn't require thousands of pounds of explosives. But naturally, it it was a nuclear weapon. Well, before too long, Somebody came up with the idea and said, well, if you can give it to the engineers, why not give it to the special operations folks uh, to do similar things but behind the lines? So um, a version of it was built and tested. Um, The Navy uh, underwater demolition teams, which later became the SEALs, uh, were involved in the testing. Uh, But because of the classification of the weapon, which was above top secret, the only uh, special forces unit that had people that were completely cleared to do it was the unit in Berlin. So they called on our unit uh, to do some of the initial testing. This was 1956, 1957. And so we did did actual testing. Uh, tests or the unit did actual tests by by outfitting a team with a weapon, uh, jumping it into Germany to hit a notional target in southern Germany, and then they were graded, of course, by by the people that watched it, uh, all to see whether or not it was feasible. Uh, it was feasible, and it eventually led to a to the development of a smaller nuclear device which was called the Special Atomic Demolition Munition, which was 
probably the actual weapon that got the name trash can nuke. The first weapon uh, they tested was about 400 pounds total and required four people to carry it. The second weapon they developed was uh, smaller, more efficient, smaller yield, but it only weighed 50 pounds and could be carried by one guy. So those That weapon uh, remained in service uh, for quite a while. It's only been, I think, it was withdrawn from service in the mid-1980s. Right, because I saw, I saw some photos of parachute drops with one of these sort of look like dangling from the parachutist's leg. Yeah. Um, well, when when as far as the American way of jumping in, we strap uh, all our equipment uh, onto a lowering line harness that that is carried underneath your reserve parachute when you jump and then it is uh, let loose so that it dangles below you about 30 feet. Uh, that way when when it hits the ground you're behind it and you don't have to try to land with an additional 100 pounds on your body. Um, so that was, the, that was the approved method for getting these things in. Uh, and yeah, anyway... Yeah, it, it's just the thought of even having a small nuclear weapon um, dangling thirty feet below you and dropping by parachute is uh, must be quite an unnerving experience. Uh, one that you were probably glad that you didn't have to do in any of your training. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I think the biggest question for the guys was whether or not the timer on the thing actually worked. Because a lot of guys. <laughs> And they said, so you want me to put this in for 10 minutes and then hit the button and leave? And yeah. it's not going to go off. And the guy would say, that's right. And I said, I'm not so sure I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Get rid of the witnesses at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. That yeah. section on the Iranian hostage crisis is quite interesting because I was probably late teens when that happened and i remember very vividly the you know the news of the crash at desert 1 which was one of the uh, landing points and then the the mission being aborted but what i hadn't realized is there were some detachment a guys s- still in tehran uh, that's correct the the first the first mission uh, the one that went bad was called eagle claw the subsequent mission uh, the second attempt the might have happened was called honey badger um our our participation in the uh, mission had a subset name and it was called storm cloud very early on um the planners uh, realized they had basically a conundrum because there were two targets within Tehran that had to be uh, taken down. One was the embassy compound where about 66 Americans were being held. And a second location was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where three more Americans were being held. Uh, So straight away, um, Delta Force, which was the stateside gunner terrorism force, uh, which had just been st- stood up and received its uh, operational okay earlier that year, uh, the commander of that unit said, I have enough on my hands just worrying about the embassy. Uh, Whereupon my commander, who was in on the planning, said, well, we can handle the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um the reason why my commander was in that meeting was that uh, we, the Army required uh, better intelligence than what was available from the agency. And the Pentagon decided to put together a small team to send into Tehran. Uh, the first two guys that were sent in were um, Berlin uh, Special Forces people uh, with... Uh, contrived passports, counterfeit passports, and covers that supported them as being businessmen. And they actually went into Tehran on several different occasions to collect intelligence. Uh, Their mission was also to put together the means uh, to get the assault force from their second landing zone uh, 
into the city. And that involves some coordination with uh, an asset from the CIA who was able to acquire uh, several uh, large trucks and buses, which were hidden in a warehouse uh, on the south edge of the city. Um, as soon as the CIA guy got his uh, part of the mission done, he left the country and it was turned over to our two guys who were later joined by a third guy by the name of Dick Meadows, um, who was uh, a, actually a civilian. He was former Special Forces, but he was working with Delta Force as an advisor. And he was chosen to go in as one of the additional people. Uh, so they were in the city um, when the force landed at Desert One, and they were actually sitting on top of a hilltop waiting for the helicopters that would have brought the forces forward to Tehran when they got the radio message that the, the mission had been aborted. Uh, they found out later in the morning that somebody in the Pentagon had made a mistake and said, oh, by the way, we have Americans who are collecting information inside Tehran. And that's when they realized that they were in real danger. Unbelievable. Unbelievable that somebody releases that information. And I mean, I, I, I am stunned by the bravery of you and your um, comrades in, you know, some of the the missions obviously you can't talk about, but just being ready to do those missions is, um, well, it, it's beyond my comprehension anyway. So some people would just question our sanity. Uh, one of them <laughs> being my wife, but uh, yeah, I, I would note I would note that um, we're coming up very quickly. April twenty fourth, twenty fifth, twenty sixth uh, is the fortieth anniversary of the attempt, uh, the Iran uh, rescue attempt. So wow, it's coming up soon. So oh, okay. I found interesting what was probably almost your last operation, which is at the fall of the Berlin Wall where the the unit um, has changed name by this point because the press had discovered information or somebody had released information to the press about the unit in the early 80s, I think it was. So yes, the un- that's correct. So the yeah. unit's then renamed to the Physical Security <laughs> Support Element, which is suitably anonymous. But when the wall falls, you're helping the Allied Refugee Operations Center, who who were basically set up to sort of like filter refugees as they as they came through, and they were obviously overloaded when the wall opened. And um, so the the units looking for what I would call persons of interest as they come across through the wall. That's um, that's correct. They're they're basically scanning everybody that comes through, giving them a basic set of uh, questions to answer, to determine whether or not they might be of interest to the intelligence collectors. And most of the people that came across uh, were basically East German citizens uh, who were looking for a better life and. Uh, just wanted to keep going west, and but occasionally they would come across um, some interesting people. Um, I think one of them was a senior officer in the East German Army who had access basically to not only all the um, telephone numbers of anybody and anyone who was important, but he had access to a lot of the training documentation for the East German military, which was, of course... Uh, very interesting to to the uh, the military intelligence people and the CIA at the time. Um, very interesting time to be in the city, uh, both to to know that the wall is falling and then actually meeting uh, some of these people that were on the other side, both the normal citizens and one gentleman comes to mind was. Uh, uh, an elderly East German that came across all by himself and just happened to mention that he had spent the last uh, number of years, 10 or 13, I believe, uh, in prison. And it turned out that uh, he had just been released and he was of interest because he had been a an asset. He had been a spy for the CIA and was arrested by the East Germans. Uh, so the CIA was, of course, very interested to uh, meet with this guy and to 
help him out um, in his new life. Wow. Wow. I hope he got his CIA pension then. <laughs> I would sincerely hope so. <laughs> Um, I, I, one bit I did like about that story is um, you said that the French were interested in a slightly different category of East German. <laughs> that that was a very offhand statement, which I may have – I didn't embellish it, but it, it was the, – the French were very interested in, in the, uh, the younger females that came across, probably, probably more so than uh, – um, the people of intelligence interests. So uh, I think they were at the point where they said, well, the Soviet Union and the East Germans army is no longer a threat to us. And we'd, we'd rather see if any of these women are interesting or not. (laughs) (laughs) One would say that was typically French, but I'm not sure. Well, yeah, let's not get too much international stereotypes there. Um, were, Were you in Berlin when the wall came down? I was actually, I had been transferred out of the unit. I was uh, in the United States. Uh, I had just joined with a new unit when a friend of mine called me and called me and said, turn on the TV. And it was November 9th um, in the States. And I turned it on and saw, I think it was... Um, Dan Rather. Dan Rather in front of the wall, exactly, uh, and said, oh, that's interesting. I called up Pan Am, got a ticket that evening, and was in Berlin on the 11th, um, standing at the foot of the wall. <laughs> I, I went back over so that I could take part in it. Wow. Wow. And that uh, can you describe any of that experience? Oh, it was, I mean, it was just crazy. Um of course, the East Germans were, were ecstatic, uh, belying all the problems that lay ahead with the reunification. But uh, I think at that point, nobody really understood what was happening. But uh, going into East Germany, uh, I had been there many times before, obviously, through my career. But going back over there now... Uh, and the government is basically coming apart at the seams. Um, it's it's just a, a totally strange atmosphere. And I'm uh, walking in one part of the city right in front of the, um, the uh, Berlin Gate. And people are starting to sell stuff to get money. Uh, Western Germans and Americans and Brits are coming across to buy things, obviously, because it's a whole new economic uh, paradigm. And I am looking at some things that people had set out. And one guy came up to me and said, uh, said, uh, would you be interested in buying uh, some military equipment? And I said, well, I don't know. What do you got? And I said, well, I have a T-72 for sale. <laughs> <laughs> He he was an East German Army uh, officer who, who was try, trying to profit off off of his tank battalion and said he could deliver it anywhere I wanted in East wow. Germany. I can uh, imagine. I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine the looks as you drove that through Checkpoint Charlie. It, it would have been interesting. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I had to turn him down. I didn't have that much money. Uh, he probably sold it to somebody else. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was a wild, wild atmosphere, party atmosphere. Uh, and, yeah, I think it, that that part of it would last for about six months uh, until the reality of the world set in. Yeah, yeah. What would you say was the best thing about being in detachment A? Um, the best thing about detachment A was, I think beyond the camaraderie, which was incredible. It was probably the most unique unit, um, in the U S army, uh, from that, that from the 1950s to 1990s, it, it was definitely the most unique, uh, it was sort of a hybrid unit between special forces and intelligence, uh, sort of a modern day version of the Office of Strategic Services. It, basically, everything that that I had imagined when I first saw that recruiting brochure that my father brought home. Uh, it was a great place to be. Being in Berlin, in that some people didn't like it. A lot of guys would come there and they wouldn't last for long because you were in sort of a 
we had what we called wall fever because we were closed in a small space that, that was sort of oppressive. And you knew on the other side of the wall were a whole bunch of people that wanted to kill you. But uh, being inside the city was, you know, there's not a great deal to do. You couldn't go hunting and fishing very easily. A lot of the guys didn't like being in a city all the time. Myself, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was... Uh, the atmosphere at the time was just, it was like being in a Le Carre novel almost. <laughs> well, you were in a John Le Carre novel. And what would you say was the worst thing about being in detachment, eh? <sighs> I'm thinking, which is interesting because I actually have to think on this one. Um, I can think of one really bad moment, and this actually has to do with your forces, was... Um, 1979, um, Warren Point in Ireland, when the second parachute, uh, regiment was ambushed and a number of, uh, two para guys were killed. I think 20, I want to say 20, some, uh, British soldiers were killed. Uh, yeah. There was a double explosion, wasn't there? There was a, an initial one. And then they, the IRA set off at another one where they knew that people would take shelter and that was the same day that lord mountbatten uh, was was murdered um it was bad because tupera had just come from a rotation in berlin and we uh we managed to make a lot of friends in tupera and a number of them were lost that day that's probably the worst that was the worst experience i had there I've really enjoyed um, speaking with you. That it, it, I, I, it's been a pleasure, but it has been an honour as well to speak to somebody who's been in a a, a very select band of um, of soldiers that have um, served in Detachment A. And I do recommend to my listeners your book. Uh, it's called Special Forces Berlin, Clandestine Cold War Operations of the U.S. Army's Elite, 1956 to 1990. There will be links to the book in the show notes, and we are also doing a listener giveaway. So uh, make sure you check out the show notes for uh, details of that. But James, thank you very much for speaking to me. Ian, it's been a pleasure. I enjoy talking about the unit, as you can tell. Um, most importantly, the guys that I served with deserve all the credit. Um, it was an amazing bunch of people to work with. My, my career in the military was great, but I count my service in Berlin and the people I met there as, as the highlight of of my military career and so being able to talk to you about it and being able to write of the history of this very unique unit that was filled with very strange bizarre wonderful people well, was an honor for me too so I, I thank you for the opportunity to talk well no and i thank you and your comrades for the, their service as well thanks ian and we have further photos, videos and information on this episode in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get one of those Cold War Conversations coasters, help keep us on the air, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And if you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. <laughs>